Mr. President, it's great to see you again. Thank you Good for to doing see you. this. So that was one hell of a speech you gave Thursday night. I'm going to touch on three specific areas there. The first one being, you know, I noticed the look of surprise on your face when you walked into the chamber and you saw Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene. Um, it was priceless. You feigned shock at, at seeing her. But during your response to her heckling of you, you used the word illegal when talking about the man who allegedly killed um, uh, Lake and Riley. An undocumented person. And I shouldn't have used illegal. I should have, it's undocumented. And look, when I spoke about the difference between Trump and me, one of the things I talked about on the border was that his, the way he talks about vermin, the way he talks about these people polluting the blood. I talked about what I'm not going to do, what I won't do. I'm not going to treat any, any, any of these people with disrespect. Look, they built the country. The reason our economy is growing, we have to control the border and, and more orderly flow. But I, I don't share his view at all. So you, you regret using that word? Yes. Um, what was it like for you to see Republicans not cheer your tough words for Vladimir Putin or for defending democracy or any of the other things Republicans used to stand for? Well, I think some of them still do stand for it, but they're pretty much intimidated by Trump right now. I mean, the idea that, look, I'm talking to you, I'm down here talking to these folks who are starting businesses, getting endorsed by minority businesses. He's up with Marjorie Taylor Greene in North Georgia. Yesterday, he spends the time at his mansion with uh, at his resort with Orban. He talks about his great respect for, you know, the president of North Korea. I mean, he praises Putin. I mean, it's, it's a different world. Was that a mistake on, on Trump's part? to host Orban. I mean, he is a member of NATO. He's a member of NATO, but he says he doesn't believe in democracy. I mean, look, the guys I host, the people I'm with, are people who, in fact, in NATO have great respect for one another. And uh, but uh, look, when you have a president who, in the midst of the carnage going on as a consequence of Russian attack on Ukraine and talks about Come in, Putin, if, you, if these guys haven't paid their dues, you, you just do what you need in NATO. I mean, NATO, he, he talked about getting out of NATO. I mean, it's a critical to our national defense. We made a commitment after World War II to never let it happen again. Look what he's doing. He's dangerous. Um, you were caught on a hot mic after your State of the Union address talking to Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Senator uh, Michael Bennett, uh, saying, quote, I told him, BB, and don't repeat this, but you and I are going to have a come to Jesus meeting. What do you mean by that? What I meant was, it's an expression used in the southern part of my state, meaning a serious meeting. And uh, it was, uh, I've known BB for 50 years, and he knew what I meant by it. So what's the, what's the come to Jesus part? What, what's, what's rid, what tough get, love do you, are you going to give to the prime minister? What's happening is, he has a right to defend Israel, a right to continue to pursue Hamas, but he must, he must, he must pay more attention to the innocent lives being lost as a consequence of the actions taken. He's hurting, I, in my view, he's hurting Israel more than helping Israel by making the rest of the world, it's contrary to what Israel stands for. And I think it's a big mistake. So I want to see a ceasefire. And I'm starting with a major, major exchange of prisoners for a six-week period. We're going into Ramadan. It should be nothing happening. And we should build off of that ceasefire. And look, I've spoken with the majority of the Arab leaders from Saudi Arabia to Egypt to Jordan. They're all prepared to fully recognize Israel and begin to rebuild the region. And uh, that's, that's the focus. What comes after Gaza? What's next? It's a tough decision, but there's a lot that can be done. On the ceasefire, will one, will, I mean, it is, it is Saturday. Um, the holy month of Ramadan starts on Monday. Is it possible that a ceasefire deal could be reached in time for, the, for Ramadan to start? I'm a CIA director in that region right this minute still talking about it. I think it's, uh, it's always possible. I, I never give up on that. What is your red line with Prime Minister Netanyahu? Do you have a, a, a red line? For instance, would invasion of Rafa, which you have urged him not to do, would that be a red line? It is a red line, but I'm never going to leave Israel. 
the defense of Israel is still critical. So there's no red line, I'm going to cut off all weapons so they don't have the Iron Dome to protect them. They don't have. But there's red lines that if he crosses and they can, he cannot have 30,000 more Palestinians dead as a consequence of going after. There's other ways to deal, to get to, to deal with the, with, with the trauma caused by Hamas. And it's like, I, well, look, the first time I went over, I sat with them and I sat with a work cap and I said, look, don't make the mistake America made. America made a mistake. We went after bin Laden until we got him. But we shouldn't have gone into Ukraine. I mean, we, should, we, we shouldn't have gone into um, you know, the whole thing in Iraq and Afghanistan. It wasn't necessary. It wasn't necessary. It just caused more problems in the race than it's going to cure it. Who, who actually wants a deal? Do you think Hamas actually wants a ceasefire? Well, I think Hamas would like a total ceasefire across the board because they, then they would see they have a better chance to survive and maybe rebuild. But that's not what I think the vast majority of people think you have to look. After what happened in World War II and the carpet bombing that took place, what happened was we ended up in a situation where we changed the rules of the game, what constitutes legitimate rules of war. And they should be abided by. Some have suggested you should go back to Israel uh, and address the Knesset, the Israeli, Israeli parliament. Is that something you would do? Yes. Would that have to be at the invitation of the prime minister or could that be at the invitation of the president? I'd rather not discuss it more. Does that mean that that has been that has been discussed? The possibility of going back to Israel and Doesn't addressing the Knesset. Okay, <laughs> let's talk about the temporary pier that you announced during your State of the, the Union address to get supplies into into Gaza. It's going to take sixty days to get that um, constructed. What more are you doing in the absence of cooperation from Netanyahu and a bill from Congress to get supplies into Gaza, more humanitarian aid into Gaza? Everything we can. Uh, we're pressing Israel to open up access to the north from Israel. We're, we're also doing airdrops. I know several people were killed with the airdrop. There's a way to avoid that in the future. We're working with our Arab friends to figure out how much we can get in. Everything, look, it's a desperate situation. Food, medicine, everything needed, they're badly needed, and it's needed now. Um, you're heading to Michigan, where, um, you know, on the campaign trail, probably in the next few days, where more than 100,000 people voted uncommitted in, in the primary to protest your handling of the situation in Gaza. Some have said they will never vote for you. One told Charles Blow of the New York Times, and I'm quoting, as bad as Mr. Trump's rhetoric was and him putting a travel ban on five Muslim countries, he wasn't overseeing and actively arming a genocide. Those are tough words. What's your response to that widely shared sentiment? It's not widely shared. You guys make judgments you don't, you're not capable of making. That's not what all those people said. What they said was they're very upset, and I don't blame them for being upset. There are families there. There are people who are dying. They want something done about it. And they're saying, Joe, do something, do something. But the idea that they all think it's genocide is just not, that's a different situation. Look, I can fully understand, and can't you? You have a family member there, a family member, families that come from a family that, that is still isolated there and may be victimized. It's understandable they feel that way. And that's why I'm doing everything I can to try to stop it.